Welcome to the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm Nate Hedrick. And I'm David Bright. We're both pharmacists and real estate investors that believe that real estate investing does not have to distract from a meaningful career in pharmacy. Each episode, we share stories that educate and inspire pharmacists to leverage real estate investing as a part of your financial plan. Hey, David, how's it going? Hey, good, thanks. How you doing, man? Good. It's uh, vacation season, also known as summer for us. And it's just been, yes. uh, it's been a good time. It's, it's, uh, the home buying has been a little crazy, but the vacation part has been, has been good. Yeah, it, the market has been a little odd. I, I know before we hit record, you and I were both venting to each other that, you know, it has just been an odd market, like at least in my world. And you have better stats because you're an actual realtor, right? Like you you know the stats better than I do. But from where I'm sitting, there's just not a lot of houses on the market. And when they hit, they are moving so quickly, even if they need a lot of work. Yeah, we're seeing similar. I mean, my anecdotal evidence is that uh, we're seeing an uptick in inventory, at least a little bit. Um, but what's interesting is that it seems like the the good houses, right, the ones that are priced well mm-hmm. and ready to move into, are still fairly low, and those are selling crazy fast, crazy high, yeah. like just always bonkers. But we are getting more of these like outlier homes where maybe it's uh, needs a lot of extra work or it's priced really poorly. Um, and it's just kind of somebody asking for the top dollar. So we're seeing a little more inventory, but it's not always good inventory, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. We're exactly what I'm seeing. There's houses out there that I've reviewed several times. I'm like, is there something <laughs> I could do there? And they're just, there just isn't. It's just priced like wild or, or something's terribly wrong with it. Or yeah. you know, or then we offered 20% over ask the other day, all cash, waived Jeez. inspections. And, uh, and this was a hoarder house. And we, mm-hmm. we said, leave behind anything you want. Just lock the door on your way out. We'll take care of it. That didn't even get it. 20% over ask all cash. We, we couldn't get that house. So I couldn't believe how, just how competitive it's getting even for some like a hoarder house that needed a lot of work. Yeah. I, again, I think I, I, I'm surprised, but I also am not surprised because those houses yeah. that are like that are just, they're, they're cutthroat. Like the, when they're priced right, it, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that the pricing like is something we probably should dive into deep one episode <laughs> of like th- how much strategy goes into pricing because I do see people that will put list a house just a little bit below maybe where they think it'll sell it'll attract a ton of traffic in a bidding war and if they're just a little bit too high or sometimes even a lot too high you won't get any traffic nobody looks at it nothing at all when they're trying to squeeze top dollar yeah, I mean, again, not to go off on a tangent because it, I think it's a super interesting subject, but I was just talking to this. Uh, I've got a client that's listing a house here on Friday, and we were just talking this morning about that. And I said, look, here, here's where I think market value is. Now, here are our strategies for how to price that. And what I find is that if, if uh, again, if I can choose a strategy that makes sense for their situation. For example, they want to sell this quickly because they're buying another home and they're already under contract. So our strategy mm-hmm. is to list it slightly under market value and try to get those offers to come in quickly. Yeah. I've got some so- sellers who are like, I want as many dollars as you can get for this. I don't care if it sits for three months, like keep yeah. it high and wait for the perfect person to come around. And, and, and sometimes that works and sometimes you get more dollars, but sometimes that, that doesn't. And so like, you really have to go into it with an idea of what's market value and then what's our strategy because it, it, it can get complicated for sure. Definitely. Definitely. Now uh, we've said often that we're here for education and inspiration. So I, I do want to bring us back to know it, not just venting and whining about the market, right? You know, seems fair. in, in fairness, you were just saying that you've closed a lot of transactions this year, already in the first half of 2024 as, as a realtor, we've, we've been fortunate being able to buy several houses so far this year. We're, we're on track with where we want to be. So things are still getting done. It's just taking some extra work, some extra strategy, some extra, uh, just intentionality in the purchase process to make that happen. Yeah, actually, I've been lucky. Even uh, here in early June, uh, we've done, I think we've done five transactions for buyers and then several more for sellers. And I've got a few more in the pipeline that are still cooking. So yeah, we've been, we've been busy with that, but um, it, they're not all, they're not all deals, right? Like a lot of these are good move in ready properties. I've got buyers that are buying properties that they themselves are living in, um, but they're not all great real estate investing deals, if that makes sense. 
Right, right. Because owner occupants are looking for something a little different than investors typically are, right? As investors, we're looking for something that's hopefully like right at market value, maybe even a little bit discounted. And so we're thinking through different strategies to get that done. And so particularly with the market just being really wild right now, we thought this would be a great time to do a mid-year market check-in and talk about some of those strategies. We, we picked out ahead of the episode four tangible strategies that we think work in today's market because they're things that you and I are actively doing. Yeah. And, and what we try to do is, is to make this useful, whether you're buying a single family home or a small multifamily, um, whether it's a house hack, you know, whether you're buying a short-term or long-term rental, whether you're buying a house to flip, like it should apply to just about any situation to give you a few more arrows in your quiver uh, that investors can use to, to make sure they're not overpaying for an investment um, and try to avoid some of those those bidding wars, or at least be armed when you go into one of those bidding wars, if that's if that's the route you're going. Right, right. And we we want to be cautious that we're not here to say if a specific property is a good deal or a bad deal. Because just like you said, that owner occupant that you're helping to buy a house, they're super happy that they found their dream home, right? Like criteria is different when you're occupying it versus when you're investing, when you're investing for different strategies. So it's not a good deal or a bad deal. It's talking about uh, how to find properties at a discount instead of paying a premium for that property. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that that really well. I think it's worth worth expanding on that. Even if you know you might buy a property that doesn't cash flow, and eighty percent of people that look at that are going to say that's a bad deal, right? You don't you don't cash flow every single month. But if you know for whatever reason that this is an appreciation play, and you just need to break even, or that uh, you see market rents going up, and you've got market factors that you think are going to drive it up, and and that's the reason you're going into it, it, it might be a great deal for you. So yeah. It, Assessing whether something is a good or a bad deal is not something we're going to be able to do sitting here. But what we can do is kind of go and give you a snapshot of just some of those strategies and and give you an idea of of ways to attack the market that you might not have otherwise have thought of. So <clears throat> I'll hit them really quickly. Um, and we'll dive into each one of these, but just so you have kind of that 10,000 foot view of where we're going. Um, we're going to talk about looking for properties that might be tenanted or especially those that are tenanted with problem tenants. We'll look at paying uh, for houses that are that are higher days on market and what that means. Mm -hmm. We'll look at properties that are back on market after failed inspections. It's actually how I bought my first investment property it was a, a back on market home. And then we'll look at properties uh, with hidden potential and what that means. And that's something we've talked about a little bit in the past, but we'll kind of reiterate some of those those tricks here as well. Yeah. So let's let's just dive right into the first one, that, mm -hmm. that problem tenants or properties that are already tenanted. And so I know we've talked about that a little bit on the podcast so far, but but this has been one that seems pretty effective, particularly as landlords are thinking, you know, the market's coming up. I got in maybe pre-pandemic. There's a way to sell and move that equity and do something else. And so if a landlord is just kind of tired and done, particularly if they're getting headaches from a problem tenant, they may be ready just to, to let it go a little cheaper. And so we found that to be very effective in, in competitive market situations, though. So I do want to back up and just share, though, that in a lot of jurisdictions, a written lease applies to a property no matter who owns that property. So Nate, if you have a terrible tenant in a rental and you sell me that house, the simple act of selling the house and the change of ownership generally does not break a lease, right? Different jurisdictions, different laws, we're not attorneys, all that stuff. But generally, <laughs> I would not assume that just the transaction is going to break the lease. Uh, so instead, the lease transfers to the new owner. Sometimes that's that's referred to under this umbrella term of tenants' rights mm -hmm. because it's meant to protect the tenant from the surprise need to move out just because the landlord says, well, I'm selling on Friday. You got to go. So, Nate, I know that's how it is in my neck of the woods. Is that how it works in Cleveland? Yeah, absolutely. And and a really good clarifier that like you you don't get to just wipe out the lease. I've I've actually seen this posted on places a bit like Bigger Pockets and Facebook REI groups that I'm in where they're like, Hey, just bought a new property. Uh, is this a cool letter to send as like a new lease for the tenant? And it's like, Oh, you just face palm. Like yeah, you don't, you don't get yeah. it, man. It's not how it works. Um, so yeah, really important to, to understand what lease is in place today. Um, how that, that lease is operating. Um, and that's an, also what I recommend for, for my clients to get what's called an estoppel agreement, which is something that you can mm -hmm. put in place to make sure that everyone involved understands the terms of that lease, specifically the tenants. So what you'll do is everybody sign this agreement that says, hey, 
all three parties think this is what's going on. We think this is the security deposit. We think this is the monthly rent. We think this is how long the lease is in place. It just gives you that that extra backing of like, okay, when I buy this, this is all the baggage that's coming with it. Um, because if there is a problem and you think it's going to go away in a month because you think the lease is going to end, but but it's actually another 12 months of that lease, that, that's a whole different ballgame. So you have, to, you have to really understand that stuff inside and out. And I actually ran into the situation fairly recently. We actually had a property um, we were looking at and the, the tenant had a really long-term lease in place and they were actually getting um, getting some assistance through, through a voucher program here in Cleveland. And um, basically through lack of either lack of landlord bothering or lack of, of communication, I, I'm not exactly sure, the, um, the property failed their inspection for that voucher to kick in. And so the, the, the voucher program stopped paying the landlord, the tenant stopped paying the landlord. And so this landlord was sitting there with a valid lease, but not collecting any rent. And the eviction process was going to be months and months and months because again, they weren't actually doing the repairs they needed to, to qualify as a lead, like a listing. So it's one of those kind of classic examples of like, everybody's real frustrated in that situation. You might be able to come in as a new non-frustrated party understand all the terms of what's going on, hopefully, and then come in and buy it at a, at a discount and then take over and start start managing it better, right? So that's that happens all the time where these problems come up and just everybody wants to give up and be done with it. And so it's a it's an opportunity for someone new to show up. Yeah. And it, even as, as I hear you explain that story, because I know we we talked when that one came up just as an <laughs> example of, of yep. like, man, can you believe this? Yeah. You know, even as you explained how just poorly that whole thing had unfolded and how it just became lose, lose, lose for everybody involved. Tenants are living in a property that's in disrepair. Mm -hmm. The landlord's not taking in any rent. The voucher program, they want this person to be in a good situation. They, they and Nobody's winning, right? right. And so that story was, I mean, it's pretty intimidating even to me who's been a landlord for a while. <laughs> so I can see why there would be not a lot of demand for something like that, right? It's not investors lined up to take on a really ugly problem like that. Yeah, I mean, as soon as I pitch that to to, a, to an investor or a buyer, right, it's going to be like, whoa, that sounds like a whole bunch of headaches. Even if I send yeah. that to a really good property manager, right, like if I if I picked up that deal and said, hey, property manager that I've worked with for years, uh, can you help me sort this out? They would be like, oh, Nate, I don't want to unwind any of this. <laughs> like, no, I don't want to do that. Right. And right. that's so. Yeah, there, there's a deal there, right, for somebody that wants to deal with that headache. But you got to be the right team, the right person to to, to unwind all that mess. Yeah. And, and, but that is then if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and do that work mm -hmm. of fixing the management issue, then you may be able to get that property at a discount because that landlord may just be so frustrated and so ready to walk away. Particularly like we've, like we've said, when real estate values have gone up so much, that landlord probably has a decent amount of equity mm -hmm. and they may just be willing to let it go for uh, below market price just to be done with it because they probably have enough equity to do that. Yeah, you're um, totally right. You know, there was one example of a property with a non-paying tenant in place in, in my area. And I'm, I'm sure this scared off a lot of investors because who wants to buy a property with a non-paying tenant and where you know that immediately after purchase, you have to go to court and you have to start the eviction procedure. And it, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. And that's kind of how it was shared with us right away. But when we started looking into the property a little more. We did the showing. We learned that the tenant wasn't paying because there wasn't heat at the house. And remember, I'm in Michigan. Like you need heat in a house in Michigan in the winter, right? So, uh, you know, we saw an opportunity here with with being able to rectify the situation a little bit. So when we bought the house, we fixed the furnace like immediately and the tenant was thrilled. And it was, it was wild because it was like a $200 repair or something. Like it wasn't Man. even this huge thing, but the tenant started paying right away. So sometimes it is a really ugly situation. There's kind of gradients of ugly and, and we were willing to jump into <laughs> something that wasn't quite what you were describing, but it was like the furnace is out. Let's get the tenant some heat. Let's make, let's make this a better situation for everybody. And then maybe we can, we can get some goodwill and we can get this working again.
Yeah, I, it's a good reminder that like there are some bad landlords out there, and sometimes the bad situation that they're selling is their fault. Like it's just their fault. And if you can come in and have a level head and be a decent human being, like you might be able to find a good deal and help everybody involved. So I, yeah, I, it's a great reminder, David. I'm glad you shared that story. It, it sometimes it's just the reset button of new people. Like it could yeah. have just gotten like so ugly between everybody involved. That, like True. okay, new person, let's try this again. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, you know, you think as you're talking, you obviously we're talking about how this works for like a long term rental, but you do also a fair bit of flips. We've done some flips together in the past. Like, would this sort of strategy work for flips? Do you think? So kind of, I would say it depends on what you mean by house flipping. Okay, because uh, you know a lot of people think of like more of the true IRS definition of a house flip, where you you buy it with the intention to immediately fix it up and sell it. And so if you're if your intention is to do that, well, that's not going to work because there's probably a lease in place and there's mm-hmm. probably time left on that lease and that tenant's going to stay there for a while. Um, but if if your goal is to buy the property at a lower price and then just as time happens, like very few tenants will stay in a property for dozens of years, right? Like oftentimes someone will move out in two or three or four years and so at that point at which the tenant moves out, if you are able to get that property at a pretty serious discount originally, and then they move out, you could fix it up and sell it at that point. And so you get the uh, selling for a gain piece of a flip, but not necessarily the timeline of a flip. That makes sense. Yeah. And typically we call that like a tired landlord scenario, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think we've probably both slipped and said that term a few times, right? Like, or I know at least I have. Like, the tired landlord scenario is just this classic situation where someone's had a house for a while, they may not have raised rents in a long time. Uh, now they have a house with a long term lease in place. Nobody's interested in buying a house with this super low lease that's got a lot of time left on that lease, and so there may just be really limited demand, and the price may be therefore pretty low, also. So. Uh, we bought a house like that earlier this year where the rent is about 60% of what it should be, like pretty seriously discounted on a pretty long-term lease. And so we got the property at, at what I would say is somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% under market value in that case because the tenant was living there. An owner-occupant can't really jump in and buy it because you know, they would want to move into it. And someone with a long lease, that can't happen. And not a lot of investors want something that's cash flow neutral and you know kind of like right before we hit record i sent you a house like am i crazy i want to buy this house that doesn't cash flow like am i crazy but sometimes that's a way to uh to get a property at a discount to deal with limited cash flow or no cash flow for a season is there any you know thinking about this is there any good ways to find a property like that because i can't just search zillow for like bad houses yeah. with bad tech. Like I, there's no, like right. I, I can't Tinder profile yeah. that, right? Like how do I find these houses? Yeah. <laughs> yeah nobody types like tired landlord into their right. MLS description, right? There's, right. Bad, there's no keywords for this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what, what I do, and then tell me if you have other strategies when you look for stuff like mm-hmm. this, I like to look for, for houses where there are no interior photos at all mm-hmm. or photos where the interior photos of the property are where someone has not even remotely cleaned up for the MLS photos. Like there's dirty dishes in the sink, the bed's not made, there's toys all across the floor. You know, it looks like like probably all of our houses do at some point, but nobody <laughs> takes MLS pictures mm-hmm. like that unless it's it's a tenanted situation and uh and there's just not a lot of of care to make sure that it's going to sell for top dollar, right? And so in those kind of situations, photos like that are probably going to turn off a lot of buyers. And then I get intrigued that that may be some kind of where the landlord and the tenant don't have a great working relationship where the landlord asks the tenant, could you clean up for the photos? And then that's what it looks like. And I, I, my insider tip, I guess on this is that uh, you should become a real estate agent. No, uh, I have because I have access to the MLS. I get access to the the broker remarks, which are like mm-hmm. notes from broker to broker. And a lot of times, you'll see stuff in there that isn't for public comment, but mm-hmm. it's like, hey, uh, you know, seller wants out because blah blah blah. And like they'll actually put stuff in there sometimes, or like call me to discuss because blah blah blah. And so sometimes you can yeah. actually find those notes hidden right in there. Um, and so asking your agent to look for those or being an agent yourself is kind of a good trick to to tap into some of those. 
Yeah. And on the, on the, I'm not a licensed realtor side of things like that. I, I will routinely text my realtor and say like, Hey, can you get the scoop on what's going on with this property Mm -hmm. to see about like a little bit of detective work? Cause even if there's not a lot of great notes on the, the agent side of the MLS, when a realtor picks up a phone and calls another realtor and says like, look, before I waste anyone's time, just tell me what's going on. Yeah. My my understanding is a lot of realtors will kind of tip their hand a little bit because again, nobody wants to waste their time. They want to find a buyer. They don't want to just get showings to happen. Yep. Has this ever, I mean, again, I know we've done this a couple of times, you and I, uh, you more than than myself, but any any like bad stories stick out of when this like doesn't work out? Because like I, I get how it could work out, but I would say there's a problem to begin with. So like, give me a bad, give me a bad example of how this can go. Yeah, I know. I know you've got a real bad one too of a painful <laughs> eviction that you had to deal with that that happened. Um, but I, yeah, I had one where we even did the estoppel agreement where everybody okay. agreed that like, yep, there is a move out coming. The tenant will move out. The lease is over. This is done. Um, six months later, the tenant moved out. Bummer. And so they just dragged their feet. And it was during a period of COVID where evictions were very time consuming. And, and uh, so it, it didn't happen. And so I had that property for, uh, for six months with no rent coming in. And then uh, when we went to check out the property after the tenant moved out, we found that they took the furnace with them, What? which was new to me. I, I had like, yeah, the, the tenant <laughs> took the furnace. Oh, so okay. fortunately, like we were going to replace the furnace anyway. It didn't end up being a, a terrible thing for us. Like we, we had planned on that, but like, it was just one of these, like, did that actually happen? Man. So yeah, there can be some, you know, fortunately that's not the every time, right? But you do <laughs> need to be prepared that if it is a problem scenario where there is a, a problem landlord tenant relationship there, it, like you do need to understand that things can go wrong and you should you should have some emergency fund ready to go. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Like I, I'm I, I'm always amazed at people that are like, oh, buy real estate with low or no money down. It's like, well, what if all these problems come up like your tenant steals your furnace? Uh, yeah. You don't get to get away with that with low and no money down. I just I I like the idea, again, as a risk averse, boring pharmacist, I mm-hmm. like the idea of having that safety net of you know, if all of this breaks bad, I've got six months of expenses saved up for just this house yep. that I can take care of it. Because otherwise, like what's, what's the alternative? Do I start just paying out of my HELOC to take care of this investment property? Like I, you, you have to have a better plan than that. And I think uh, uh, approaching this any other way is just setting yourself up for, for a big mistake. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had, like, I don't mean to make that sound like the normal story, right? Like that's a pretty (laughs) odd story, right? We've had several that have gone much better than that, where we've bought the property and the tenants have continued to pay for a long time. And then they eventually move out and then we fix it up between tenants and the next person moves in and it's fine. So like, there are a lot of times when it's fine. Mm -hmm. There are definitely times when it's not fine though. And that's part of, part of real estate investing. Yeah. Well, and hey, if the, you know, a $5,000 furnace, if you bought the house for $35,000 under market value, like you just made 30 grand, right? So you, you have to put it in some perspective, I guess. But it sounds all bad, but it, it, it doesn't always have to be. Exactly. And, th- and that's part of the buffer of buying a property uh, at such a, it's such a low price relative to market value. Mm-hmm. You can absorb some of those things that could go wrong. So yeah. Makes yeah. Sense. Yeah. So then let's let's shift gears to the second strategy, high days on market. And so with your realtor hat on, this days on market or DOM is like a, a realtor term, right? So can you walk us through what that means? Yeah, I mean, in its simplest, simplest form, it's just how many days has it been available to the public to purchase? So if I listed it on June 1st, uh, every day that it's on the market is one more DOM and it, it adds up over time. And typically what... Uh, uh, Realtors will tell you is that the first two to three weeks are the most important time periods. That first 21 days on market are sort of the the, the time where it's getting its most exposure, its most interesting, and and uh, it's new and fresh, and everybody's looking at it. After that, as you start to drag on, um, and and different markets will have different thresholds, mm-hmm. but but as time day drags on, and those days on market tends to to become more numerous, uh, the house becomes uh, kind of, it just sits there, right? And it's less likely to be purchased. Yeah. I know with, uh, even before any kind of real estate investing, I I know if a house had a for sale sign in front of it, 
for months and months and months, you start to wonder like, what's wrong with that house? Why is nobody buying that house? And so is that is that kind of the concept then behind the definition of as it sits there longer and longer, the days on market goes higher and higher, there's probably something wrong with it? I think so. I think that's part of it, right? I've, I've definitely heard that sentiment from buyers before. I think the other thing is just the way that the algorithms work for things like mm-hmm. Zillow, things like mm. yeah, even, even MLS auto emails, right? Like if you think about it, when I put a property on market, Everybody who's watching that market for that that type of property gets an email blast in their inbox in that first week. Yep. And then if we drop the price in two weeks or maybe three weeks, right, because it's not selling, they get another email blast. Hey, look at this property you might have missed. And then on Zillow, it's like, hey, there's a new property in your neighborhood. Check this out. Um, so like they're it's getting they're getting hit over the head with this property. Once you reach like three months you're no longer seeing it in front of you. All these other properties are hitting you over the head. So you don't get that kind of feeling anymore. So even if, even if it's not that sentiment of like, maybe there's something wrong with it, it's just no longer front of mind. And so it just kind of falls to the back, even if it's not a bad property to begin with. Yeah. So then if it's, if it's sitting there and it's not selling, especially in a hot market, like, like today, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the problem, problem property kind of thing could be there, but like we've mentioned before too, there could be something about the list price, right? Is it, is that something in that factor? Generally speaking, and this is what I'll advise my clients, especially you know if they're selling, is that if we sit on market for a, a X amount of time, right, and it's going to be market specific, we're probably just priced too high, right? I can give you an idea of market value. Uh, I can give you an opinion of value. That's what we're here to do. But the market itself is going to bear that value, right? If, if I think it's worth 250000 and we're getting no showings and no offers, it's probably not worth 250,000, right? Like it, it, if we're priced mm-hmm. right, they're going to mm-hmm. buy it. So um, it, it typically is is that it's priced too high or like you said, there's something truly wrong with it. Like I've seen properties that are priced fine for the area, but it's a massive foundation issue or, um, yeah. you know, it needs a new garage and no one wants to pay for it. And it's going to be 20 grand in cash to like get it all fixed. Right. It's just, th- yeah. there's, there's a problem that's preventing that house from being actually worth the amount that it's worth. Yeah. We saw one recently where the roof was so bad. Someone had just patched it with sheet metal, just <laughs> nailed into the roof. And so it's like, you do not need to be a licensed builder or a roofer to understand that like b- big sheet metal patches on your roof is probably a bad sign, right? <laughs> like things like that may, uh, but you know, that that's something that we've started to look for in, in my market is once a house has been on market for 30 days or more, which mm. Again, right now, if, if we were talking in like 2009, that'd be normal, right? But uh, that'd still be low days on market. But right now in this season, 30 days on market without it having gone pending is is pretty high. So to me, that's that sign. The price is too high. Something's wrong. So particularly, uh, and and I don't know what you, what you advise clients to do as far as when to make a price reduction, but we tend to see, at least in my market, price reductions tend to happen about the 30-day mark. So mm-hmm. if they haven't reduced the price yet, we may make a low offer, figuring that they're probably thinking about a reduction anyway. And so maybe that's a good time to jump on you know, 5 or 10% below list price. Maybe we could get it at that point. Yeah, I think that's smart. And especially because you know your market, right? I think for, for me, it would come down to what the strategy is. So if the strategy is list this at what we think market value is and just sit, I might not recommend a price reduction for six weeks mm-hmm. or more. If the yeah. if the strategy is like we want to get this sold uh, and we want an offer within a month, like those are ones where I'm going to price it competitively and I'm going to drop the price in two weeks if we don't get an offer, right? Just to keep it front of mind, get it moving, try yep. to get someone to pick it up. Um, but again, it depends on the strategy. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've even done that where we have a little bit of, of odd, an oddball house for some reason, something's just a little different about Mm -hmm. it. We're really not sure what the value is. We may even go high for a week or two with the plan to drop it right away. If we're just like testing the market like that. So you're, you're kind of like the, like Walgreens, right? Like originally $24, but now (laughs) 1299, you're like, Oh, it's so good. I can't possibly pass this up. Right. Right. right, right. Marketing strategy. I like it. Yep. Yep. And you know, it kind of reminds me of the third strategy we're going to talk about too, and that's looking at properties that are back on market, specifically those that are back on market after like a failed inspection or for some reason going uh, under contract and then back out of contract. Uh, I think you were telling me recently, like before we hit record, that, that this this worked out for you recently. You, you were able to succeed with this. 
Yeah, we, we did get one, uh, just a few weeks ago like this, where it went, it came back on the market and it came back on the market after, you know, a week or so. So mm -hmm. to me that fit the timeline of someone got a home inspect inspection and someone kind of got scared, but I know we often say like fails a home inspection, but uh, it's not really a pass fail sort of thing, like a, like a course or an exam, right? Like it's not it, like uh, uh, an inspection isn't really good or bad. It, it's just, can you explain that a little more from a realtor standpoint of what you've seen in buyers? Yeah. So uh, the way I explain it, like when I'm working with a buyer, the decision point, the, the scary part is mm -hmm. when you waive inspections, right? So when I put mm -hmm. an offer on a property and I put a seven day inspection window on it, I'm basically saying I want to buy this property, but I want to think about it for seven days, right? And my thinking yeah. about it is getting an inspection and really kind of mulling it over and so on. And so anywhere in that seven days, I can cite the inspection as my reason for walking away and get my earnest money back. And it's really kind of a no harm, no foul situation. I might pay a little bit in terms of an inspection fee or whatever, but but that that decision point, once I waive those, those inspection contingencies, I'm pretty locked into purchasing that property. And so what we often see is that people who get to that point, they may have been enough to get over the hump of putting in an offer, but they may not be at the point where they're ready to buy that home. And it could be something truly was found on inspection. It's a problematic and they don't want to deal with it. Or it could just be that like once they got into it, they realized this wasn't their house and they, they're no longer in love with it. And so that's that that happens all the time. Yeah. And, and that's... Uh... I think we should probably mention that that's an Ohio thing. I know Michigan's pretty similar. Mm -hmm. Some states, that inspection contingency works a little differently. So another reason to work with a realtor that knows your local jurisdiction rules on these kind of things, but but absolutely. And it doesn't have to be state specific. It can be MLS specific. I, I should, I'm mm -hmm. really glad you clarified that because I think I put my realtor hat on. I'm like stuck in Cleveland, Ohio, right? But yeah. I've worked with buyers all over the country uh, through the concierge service and we had one where the MLS put in a rule. So their local board of realtors put in a rule that if you try to walk away for an inspection, you have to give, well, how did it work? You had to give some sort of, oh, you had to give the report. Like they either you have to give the report or give the exact things you want fixed as like a bulleted list. And the seller gets three days to basically respond to that. And we had a buyer that, basically wanted out, did that, mm -hmm. gave them a list of like 40 something items of stuff. They're like, well, they'll, no one's going to say yes to this. They yeah. gave them the full list because they wanted out. And the seller said, yep, I'll take care of all those. And they're like, oh shoot, now, now what do I do? Like I'm, I'm kind of yeah. stuck. Like unless I burn my earnest money, yeah. I'm really stuck. So mm -hmm. You got to watch. You're, you're totally right. You have to watch what your local ordinances are. Ask your agent like, hey, if I put this offer in, what exactly does that mean? How do I walk and how do I get stuck? Because those are really good questions to ask before you you are in that position. Yeah. And, and there's probably something there too about your your risk aptitude as mm -hmm. a buyer. Because uh, I know like like you mentioned, when we, when we flip houses, we'll run into things where like we had, we had a a house we sold recently where the roof was about 10 years old. And if it has a 20 year life expectancy and it's 10 years old, to me, that doesn't rise to the list of like, we need to fix this. Like it's, it's got another 10 years left on it. Uh, but a buyer did a home inspection. The home inspector said, you're going to need a roof in the next 10 years. And they said, okay, we're calling that a fail and we're walking away. Mm. And I was really surprised by that. Yeah. We, we fortunately had another buyer come along that they also did a home inspection and they bought the house like that, that didn't fail for them. So it, just because a house fails an inspection and somebody backs out leveraging that inspection contingency, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean there's something uh, bad for every buyer, maybe just bad for, for that buyer. Yeah. It's funny. I am dealing with that actually right now with a client. Uh, we had a radon inspection done and uh, the level came back below the EPA uh, requirement or the EPA risk mm -hmm. level of four, but above the World Health Organization limit of two. And so there's some gray area there. Like there's no safe rate on levels. Like when do you mitigate? Like it's only a $1,500 mm -hmm. fix, maybe a thousand dollar fix. But if the seller's like, well, I wouldn't mitigate that. And the buyer's like, well, I don't want to live in that house, that level of rate on like, Ugh, okay, that becomes a, a point of discussion. And so, yeah, it, it can be something as small as that, that, that actually puts the buyer off. 
And, and I like what you mentioned about the report too, because for some of these things, it is really very objective like mm-hmm. that. If, if it's reading 3.1, mm-hmm. then if you disclose that, then someone may not even have to do that inspection again. They could just say like, oh, okay, well, I'm fine with that. Or right. you know what? I'm not fine with that. I'm not going to write an offer. And so it can, it can clarify that kind of thing. But you know, we, we did that for the property that we were talking about earlier, where it, uh, it fell out of contract and went back on the market due to failed inspections. We reached out and, and said, Hey, what's going on? Why did it fail? Mm-hmm. And the agent on that end, and I don't know if this is all that normal or not, but they just sent the full inspection report Ooh, and they just said, here's like all 60 pages of the PDF, <laughs> read it. If you like it, you know, you can walk it. If you don't like it, we don't need to bother each other further. It was it was really kind of win win in that in that standpoint. So we were able to do that, put some numbers together, and and write an offer where the offer took into account some of these things that were hidden and that we would need to take care of. Yeah, we're actually I'm doing that on a listing I've got coming up right now where we're getting a pre inspection done with mm-hmm. the, the basically the sellers want to move this property quickly, and so the hope is, hey, we can throw that report at anybody that wants it and be like, look. This is everything. Like, give us your offers, knowing this is what's going on, because we don't want to monkey around. Like, we we want to get this under contract, and we want to move forward. Um, so, yeah, you can you can do it lots of different ways for sure. Yeah, and, and sometimes on an, on the investor side, that can look like a way to uh, to get a house at a lower price because mm-hmm. you're walking through that inspection piece and you're recognizing, you know, these are the things that need done, and it just creates a very objective conversation of like, you know, I. I recognize that you didn't know that the furnace was bad, but when they put the CO analyzer up to the furnace, it's got a cracked heat exchanger. Like it needs Mm -hmm. replaced. And I know you may not have known about this, but this also needs replaced. And so as we do that, we can say, well, and this is why our offer is going to be this much less than the list price. Um, but I think we can. I think we can do this if if that works for you. Yeah, and and obviously, you know, don't this come off as like you're taking advantage of a bad situation? It's not. It's not what you're doing. You're not trying to just leverage. Well, hey, this thing is broken. Like, see you later. Or right. I want a bunch of money back. You know, from a seller's perspective, mm-hmm. like they're they're just trying to sell the house. In most cases, sellers right. are done with the property. They're not trying to to fix a bunch of stuff on the way out the door. Um, and so it's just you know, it's. It's a piece of the puzzle. You have to put it all together uh, and and try to take everyone's best interest into account when you're when you're looking at these things. Yeah, kind of like the tired landlord scenario, right? Mm-hmm. Like if that landlord is just ready to be done yeah. and they don't want any more headaches, they could walk away from closing when you when you bought it at like a low price, right? Mm-hmm. They may the seller may walk away from closing like dancing, how happy they are exactly. because they have sold the house, right? So just just because it's a, a a bad situation for one person doesn't mean it's a bad situation for the next, and that's where the the real estate transaction can can make that work. Yeah. All right. We promised a fourth strategy. So let's finish on that. The the hidden potential uh, could take on a lot of meetings. Uh, and one meeting that you and I discussed or what we talked about in, in part of the recent episode about use conversions. So you know where you can find a property, maybe add a bedroom as an example. We talked about that on episode 120. So we won't repeat ourselves there. But David, what other hidden potential options or what other hidden potential things have you seen? Yeah, I think one one that we haven't talked about because I like the adding a bedroom things that we talked about back on episode 120. If you're looking for some creative strategies there, that's that's one place to go. But one thing we haven't talked about would be ambiguity or mm-hmm. errors in a listing. Mm-hmm. Like one thing I often see is like when a house is listed at 1000 square feet on the nose. Like I don't know any house that's like perfectly exactly a thousand square feet, right? So then you start thinking and I may see something then like square footing square footage is estimated buyer to verify. And then it's like, well, the the listing agent for whatever reason didn't have the data, they didn't have the time, they didn't have the something. And so they they just put it out there and said, check it out. Um, and in, in my market it's pretty easy to go pull the tax history and generally in the tax history there's a, a sketch online where the county assessor has identified exactly how many square feet that is. So if the listing says it's approximately 1,000 square feet and I jump online and I find that it's 1,350 square feet, 
well, hey, maybe there's something there. Maybe they've priced this as if it's a smaller house because it, maybe it felt smaller or something like mm-hmm. that. But maybe there's a play there for some of these approximated, the ambiguity of the listing to, to have something come out there. Yeah. And I've seen cases where, like you said, that, that bad data, that garbage data, uh, even if it's input in the MLS, can, can have a, a pretty impactful uh, result because what, what most people are doing is they're grabbing uh, – automatic emails from their agent that are generated mm-hmm. using the data sets that you're asking you to put in. So if I've got a buyer who's looking for a four bedroom house that is over 2000 square feet under $400,000, like that's a very specific subset of data we're putting in. Well, if you list a, a property and you don't put any bedrooms in just because you missed it or because it's like, well, it's three, but it's fine. Like they'll, someone will figure it out. That might not mm-hmm. show up on, on an auto email and it could get missed. Uh, or better yeah. yet, like if you put in 2,000 square feet, but you actually put in like, again, this doesn't happen, but like 200 square feet because you missed a zero. Like there are thousands of people who are not going to get that listing uh, as a result. And so so bad data can actually result in some pretty interesting opportunities, especially if uh, if you see it when someone else doesn't. Yeah. And, and I've seen uh, errors in bedroom count, just like you've said, uh, it, those those things can really make a difference. And if... and if nobody catches it or if that just creates a smaller buyer pool and less competition, the house may still sell. It may still sell close to value, but it may be an opportunity to get something in a in a tight and competitive market. And I think you mentioned this a little bit before, but just to kind of land right on it, um, bad pictures or limited pictures can be a really good opportunity too. Uh, we bought a property a couple of years back uh, and I still to this day, I think the only reason we got it is because it, it was like, Everybody was waiting for the pictures to show up. I just mm-hmm. went and saw the house within an hour of it being on the market and put in an yeah. offer that day. And like, it was great inside, but it, it looked terrible from the outside. Uh, and they hadn't put any pictures up because the, the agent was either lazy or just hadn't gotten around to it yet. And so I, I swooped on it and, and got an awesome deal out of it. Yeah. And it surprises me how many times, especially for investment properties where they're tenanted, access can be difficult, things like that, where the listing agent may not have ever been inside the property yeah. before it was listed. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't realize that was a thing, but apparently that's <laughs> a thing. Yeah. It shouldn't be, but it is. And, and most often, it, like you said, it's because te- limited tenant access um, or, or sometimes it's, it's like these, these REO, uh, owned properties where like the bank owns it, for example, and they don't want anybody going inside. And so they're like, Hey, agent list this property. It's a four bedroom, two bath. Don't worry about it. And like, take a picture of outside. And that, mm-hmm. if that's the data set going in, there's a lot of limited stuff there and you can, you maybe find some opportunity. Yeah. Piling through the garbage listings, <laughs> try to find, try to find something in a tight market. The hidden so, potential, right? There you go. Yeah. Yep. So I like that the four strategies that you and I have both been using so far in 2024 to buy houses, looking for properties tenanted with problem tenants, looking for high days on market, looking for properties that are back on the market after failed inspections and properties with hidden potential. Yeah. And and of course, David, these aren't just theoretical, right? Like we, we have given a bunch of examples throughout this of how we are actually using this in our day-to-day investing, right? Yeah, yeah. And and one thing we should probably clarify before we before we stop recording today is that uh you can combine the strategies. Mm, for sure. Right? Like we had a we were able to purchase a property earlier this year that had both problem tenants and high days on market. And I don't know, maybe it was high days on market because of the problem tenants, right? It created a difficult situation, but we came in with a a pretty low offer and weren't sure if we were going to get it or not, but that ended up working. Similarly, we had a, a high days on market and a back on mar- back on market where it took a while to get that first offer. The first offer didn't result in them closing and they were excited to get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, what I really like, again, real through hat for a second, is that you're not just blindly lowballing all these, right? You're you're going in with a, a, a rhyme and a reason. It's, it's a lot less work for us uh, because you're not just like, taking $100,000 off every list price and hoping for some miracle. Uh, there's a strategy behind it, right? There's, there's an intentionality behind it. So I think that that's, that's good for your realtor partners and it's just good for your success rate too. Yeah. I've heard of people that ask realtors like, Hey, can you write like 20 offers today and just like go 20% below whatever the listing price was and just see if anyone will take it like that. That sounds, I mean, I get it. Like it's a vol, it could be a volume game, but like, 
does that ever does that work? I mean, like I get maybe right. It must, or else nobody would do it. Yeah. But man, I yeah. would, I can't be that agent for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I yeah. I just can't. It's not gonna work. So no, I get it. I I like the uh, you know. I think we're all wired with like strategy and like pharmacology, understanding the why of how the drug works. Right. We want to understand like why this might work, and so this gives some hopefully some plausible reasons why some of these strategies might work. So it's it's tough market, a lot of competition, but hopefully this gives some some hope and some encouragement to write some offers this summer and and see if you can land an investment property. Yeah, get out there, find something that nobody else sees. Uh, and if you successfully pull that off, let us know about it. Head on over to the Facebook group, the YFBREI Facebook group, or hit up David and I on, on any of the social media platforms. We'd love to hear from you guys, learn about what you guys are up to in the, the REI world because it's a, it's a crazy market right now. And so hearing from you guys keeps it, keeps it fun. All right. Enjoy the rest of your week and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you like what you heard in today's show, please leave us a review and subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. If you have a question, know someone that would make a good guest, or want to connect with us, head on over to yfprealestate.com and join the growing YFP Real Estate Investing Facebook group. As we conclude this week's episode of the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast, an important reminder that the content of this podcast is provided to you for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in this podcast and corresponding materials should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with their financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archive newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and therefore may not be accurate at the time you listen to it. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist unless otherwise noted and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thank you for your support of the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. Have a great rest of your week.